Welcome back to my channel, y'all. Uh, it's currently 10 o'clock and I'm on my way to 52 right now. We're coming off a nice $1,000 profit from last session, so hopefully we can get the street, keep the street going. Uh, yeah, see y'all inside. <laughs> We sit down at yet again another very deep table for a thousand dollars plus 20 in blue chip so 1020 uh it's a very busy night here at 52 so i come in with high hopes of good action and trust me this session does not disappoint uh our first playable hand we see is nine ten of diamonds in the big blind there's a button straddle of course and the small blind opens to 21. i just flat here and under the gun and button both call we are four way to a flop of queen five eight all diamonds uh, my first hand I decided to play I flop a flush with a redraw to a straight flush uh, small blind leads for 55 here and I'm not slow playing this one I raise to 160 under the gun folds and then the button actually just calls my raise the small blind <laughs> looks at me looks at the button looks at the board looks at his hand and utters the magical words I'm all in I'm all in I'm just loving life here as I rejam for 1,020 total, but then my heart drops when the button just basically snap calls my all in. Uh, I don't think I'm beat yet, but obviously I don't have the pot yet, and I just put all my chips at risk on the very first hand I play at this table. So regardless of how strong my hand is, I obviously have to dodge something. We all decide to run it twice. Small blind shows four or six of diamonds for a lower flush than mine. But he has a gut shot to a straight flush, so he still has outs. Uh, and then the button shows Ace of Diamonds, Queen of Hearts for the nut flush draw. It's a $2,700 pot. First run out is 10 of Hearts, 8 of Clubs. We scoop that one. Second run out is 7 of Hearts. One more card for us to be up $1,700 on our very first hand. If you don't want to see a diamond on the river, go smash that like button real quick for some good luck. Come back when you're done. doesn't fucking matter. Whoever is a deuce of diamonds, given the button, the nut flush on that board. We end up chopping the pot in this absolutely disgusting hand, and we both profit a little over $300. Um, if I would have ripped it, you know, if I would have grown some balls and said one time, we would have been up $1,700 our first hand, but lower variance might pay off better in the long run. Next spot we find ourselves in is under the gun plus two with six seven of diamonds. Uh, there's a button straddle and the big blind and under the gun both call. But the pseudo connector here, I raise to 20 and I get four callers. Uh, we're five way to a flop that comes out king king eight with the eight it being a diamond. Um, I flop three to a straight and three to a flush plus I'm the original aggressor on a paired board. So I bet 40, which I don't normally go about third pot here, but I decided to size up a little bit more here given I got four callers. Um, I want everyone to fold, but I won't be too upset with some resistance given our backdoor equity, but no one decides to go to war and everyone folds. Uh, it's nice to see our sea bets are finally getting some respect around here. We pick up Queen Jack off this hand under the gun and I open to 20. <laughs> My range in early position should be a lot tighter, but this is a deep game and I'm feeling kind of invincible, so you'll see some speculative plays pre-flop with my game, but I feel this one gives me an advantage, especially in the live realm, is my ability to apply pressure with a wide range pre-flop and then be able to navigate post-flop spots pretty well. Um, anyways, I get three callers and then the cutoff three bets to 80. <sighs> like I said, out of position here with Queen Jack offsuit, facing a three bet. I should just fold, but a wise man once said that folding is boring, and I felt that in my soul. So I call, and the hijack calls as well. Uh, we go three ways to a flop that comes out, eight jack deuce rainbow. We flop top pair, and we check it. The hijack decides to donk lead here for 100, and the button calls. I have no clue what to make of this donk lead, um, so I call. <laughs> Uh, turn brings the jack of diamonds giving us trips. It makes zero sense to bet here, so I check and they both check it back. River's a nine of diamonds, and 
I don't think checking is a great idea because it's so obvious someone has a jack in this spot. So I highly doubt either of these players would ever try to bluff this spot. So pot's at 580 and I land on a sizing of 250. I'm not really sure what I'm targeting here. The only hands that will probably call my bet that don't have me beat is like one combo of jack 10 suited and pocket pairs that just need to see if I have it. Uh, I don't really like my bet sizing here, but I also don't like a check because they're rarely going to be bluffing on this board texture and I'm just going to be giving them a free showdown. So I bet 250 and both players end up folding. The run good continues. So the next thing we pick up is Ace Eight of Hearts in the cutoff. There's a button straddle and the big blind and middle position both call. I raise it up to 25 and only the big blind calls. He's a short stack with about $200 in front of him. Uh, we're heads up to a flop of Ace of Diamonds, Five of Spades, Nine of Spades. He checks and I check it back. Uh, like I said, he's a short stack so I'm not worried about him outdrawing me. I'm just trying to maximize my value here. And by checking back, it does allow him to represent an Ace on the turn if he decides to bluff. What should maximize the value I get from his entire range? With this stack only being 200, you know, I'm not going to get like three full streets of value because of the way the pot sizing will go along with his stack. So I check back to flop hoping, hoping I can get value from bluffing hands on the turn. Uh, turn is the three clubs and he leaves for 55. It's going just as I planned and I just call. Rivers is 10 of clubs and he just checks it to me. He only has like 125 left so I just put them all in and he tanks, stares me down, I'm staring him back. He ends up making the call and we, we both show oh. Ace-8 suited. Uh, we chop that one up. <laughs> Y'all are amazing. That's a fucking poker, guys. Nice. We finally pick up a hand on the button after we straddled. Uh, we have king-queen off here and our stack is at about $2,200. Uh, there's three calls and I raised up to $35 and all three limpers call. We go four way to a flop of king of diamonds, six of clubs, four of diamonds. Checks to me and I definitely fare to have the best hand here a lot so I want to start shoveling money in now. Uh, I land on a half pop bet of $75 and I get two callers. Pot's now 370 going to return which is the four of clubs. Pair in the board, but it's very unlikely that anybody called the flop with bottom pair. So it checks to me, and I bet 175. The love jack calls, and the cutoff jams all in for 82 on top of the 70, 175. And we both just flat behind. Pot's now $770 going to the river, which is the five of diamonds. Um, and the low jack just jams all in for about 750. And... Uh, there's no side pot, so there's no reason for him to be bluffing here. Plus, he played it exactly how he would play a flush draw, and the board is paired. So, I don't beat anything but a bluff, but like I said, he's never going to be bluffing here. Um, I don't know. It sucks having to let go of your cards on the river after putting in this much money, but knowing you have the best hand. So, I moan and groan for a little bit, and I end up letting it go. Uh, the low jack, of course, shows the ace high flush, and the other player mucks his cards. Um, yeah. It was, a, it was sad. It was sad, but, you know, put the money in when we're ahead, fold in when we're behind. We, we, we played it correct. Our stack is now down to 1300 as we look down at ace-queen offsuit and under the gun plus two. Uh, there's a button straddle and the small blind calls. I raise it up to 25 and the button and small blind both call. Uh, flop comes out queen 6-6. Six, six. I see bet 25 here and only the button calls. Uh, turn is a king and I decide to check here and he bets $25. Um, I don't know. When people bet this tiny random spots, I just pay them off sometimes. I mean, no harm, no foul. Uh, I call and the river is a king. I check. He bets another 25 and I just toss him a nice little green chip for his troubles. He shows me six deuce offsuit. So he's clearly out for blood playing such a wide range against me, but obviously he's not getting max value, so I'm not afraid of him after seeing how that played out. Um, he's been talking a lot of shit about me, out loud, to the table, but I'm not going to give him the light of day and show y'all exactly what he says. Um, but yeah, this guy has been haggling me all night about being a professional and always recording everything, which I agree, does look a little weird, but I'm still getting used to being the guy at the table that's just so enveloped in his phone um, and getting the information down. Poker is a very social game, and being able to talk to the people at the table and be able to gauge their level of intelligence is a huge factor in live exploits, and by me having to write down every hand after I play it, 
um, and then pick him up, pick up my phone after each hand and record the board in front of everyone so I can remember. Uh, it does intimidate people and it restricts the amount of social connections I can make with people at the table. So when I do have the opportunity to showcase my social skills at the table, I always do my best to come across as a very respectful and nice kid. Um, it's how I was raised. Uh, this guy specifically was a pretty, pretty outrageous case of haggling for me. I've run into players like this before who just constantly talk shit to my face and I always respond with laughter and smiling. Um, if I start to try to defend myself in front of everyone, uh, it'll show that I let others have control over my emotions and I meditate every day and I listen to a lot of stoic podcasts so I'm doing my best to live by stoic principles and find control and happiness within. Um, which in turn allows me to better control my emotions in very intense environments like this. Uh, yeah, there's there's a lot more that goes into becoming a good poker player than just understanding the math. Uh, you have to be able to deal with a lot of very powerful and intense emotions. And like I said, by meditating, I'm trying to develop a strong foundation to be able to navigate these situations and to portray myself the way I view myself. After calling raises and missing and then raising and missing, uh, my stack gets down to 1160, so we're up 160 now. Um, as we look down at ace, five of diamonds on the button, I straddled and on the gun plus two raises to 20. Middle position calls, and with the suited wheel ace here and position, this is the perfect spot to three bet. So I three bet to $80, and the original raiser calls and middle position folds. Uh, heads up to a flop of ace, four, jack, rainbow. He checks, and I see bet $75, and he folds. Next hand we play is on the button again, and we straddled, small blind calls, middle position calls, and hijack raises to $15. Only nine more for us to possibly win 60, plus we have position, so I just flat, and of course other two players flat as well. Four way to a flop of king seven four rainbow. We all check it around. Uh, the turn is a four of hearts, giving us trips somehow. Um, small blind checks and middle position, who is not the original aggressor, just something to note. Uh, he bets 25 here and hijack, hijack folds. Now, I have two options here. I can raise right here and basically play my hand face up. Uh, I expect him to always call my raise, but once we get to river, the pot will be bloated and he more than likely will let go of a lot of his hands to a big bet on the river. Um, or I can call in position and have the pot get a little bit bigger and on the river he'll probably size up more than the last bet and I will be able to raise on the river for more money than I would if than I would get if I raised churn and folded out hands on the river that would more than likely uh, call the raise after I just flat the churn. Hope that made sense. Um, but yeah, this is a prime example of why positioning is so important in poker. If I was out of position here, I would be the one taking the betting lead and he would just be calling me down. Or if I checked to him out of position on the turn and he bet, I would have to raise there more often because I can't risk just calling and then him checking back the river. So when you're in position, you're able to navigate the hand better and maximize your value. Uh, so I land on just calling here, and the small blind folds. We go heads up to a river, a river, which is a blank deuce of diamonds, and he leads for 60. Now he's got to find a good sizing. Uh, so I ask him to move his hand so I can see his stack size. He has about 700 behind. Um, and this is the guy I was just talking about who was putting on a show for me. I'll let you listen. That's the internet stuff? Wow, well, internet, there's just I've had internet right there. <laughs> Make it 650. Yeah, watch him. Watch him. Yeah, you know what? Watch me. Uh, I raised the 160 and he puts in the call. I show trips and he mucks. I give you my whole stack. Oh man, nice, huh? Our stack is back up to 1450 as we look down at ace 5 offsuit and under the gun plus 2. Uh, there's no straddle and under the gun plus 1 who keeps saying he's new and doesn't know how to play that well, just limps. I open it up to 15 here and the cutoff, big blind, and plus 1 all call. 4 weights to a flop of 2 3 4 rainbow. <sighs> flop is straight. Uh, this is beautiful for me because not only did I flop the second nuts, but this innocuous type of board misses the majority of my opening range here from early position. So, with value hands in spots that you shouldn't have value hands uh, the majority of the time in, the best way to play them is aggressive. 
because if I slow down here and let other people bet and then I start to make aggressive actions on future streets, it'll be very fishy to the other players because all my bluffs will basically out at that point. So as an initial aggressor here, I decide to size up here to 45. And I say size up because I use a half pot bet in a lot of my C bets, which includes value hands and bluffs. Um, there's an argument to be made that I, need, that I need to be balanced here. And if I'm gonna use a half pot bet in the majority of my C bets, that I should take hands like this and keep them consistent with that bet sizing. But playing an unbalanced strategy at live low stakes is often the best route because a lot of players won't be reading too much into my bet sizings and lines I take with certain hands. So I can minimize loss and maximize value without being exploited too much. Uh, online is where I incorporate a lot more balance and especially heads up, which I feel I have a huge advantage in. So I actually might do a live stream soon of uh, small online heads up games. But anyways, I'm getting off track here. Uh, I bet 45 and the cutoff calls, big blind calls, and plus one calls as well. Everybody calls. Uh, pot's now 240, four way to a churn, which comes out the king of spades. Uh, big blind checks, and I don't think I'm plus one, decides to donk lead here for $100. Um, there's not any draws out there that, that I need to protect against. You know, if someone has a two pair or a set, I don't want to chase them off by raising here, so with two players left to act behind me, I just called $100, hoping the other players decide to peel one, given the great price they're getting. Uh, cutoff folds, and the big blind donates me $100. Three way to a river, which is the eight of spades. Beautiful run out. We still have the effect of nuts. Uh, big blind checks and plus one leads for 175. Um, I didn't write down exactly what his stack was at, but it was in the 225, 250 range. Uh, so now I just need to get him all in. But there's still a player in between us who has me covered. And I don't have the literal nuts, so I'm not going to just jam because the 1% of times he does have the nuts here, I lose a maximum. So I race to 500, effectively putting plus one all in. Big blind folds, and now action's on plus one, and I've been helping him learn how to play poker for a little bit, and I was giving him advice when he asked for it, so I feel bad having to put him all in here. But nonetheless, he makes the call, and he shows deuce four for two pair, and I show him the straight. He gives me a fist bump, and he ends up leaving. Uh, my man, if you're somehow watching this, I'm sorry I had to do it to you, but good luck in the future. We are now at the peak of the night with about $2,300 in front of us as we look down at Queen 10 of Hearts in the big blind. There's a button straddle and small blind calls. I call and three others call and the button raises up to $26. Of course all five other players call including myself. We're six way to a flop with $155 in the pot. Um, these are the common types of pots you'll get into in deep stack Texas poker. So to some of y'all watching this may seem like pure insanity. But remember, we don't have to pay a rake per pot. We pay for time, so that encourages people to try to play more hands within the given time and essentially just play bingo rather than everyone trying to optimize their EV by isolating and factoring a position and, and rake and all that. Um, anyways, the flop comes out king high with two hearts on it. Uh, checks to the cutoff who leads here for 45. Donk leads, actually. Um, the uh, original Razor preflop uh, raises to 147. And I have too strong of a hand to just fold yet, uh, plus I'm getting like 4 to 1 of my money, assuming the cutoff call calls. So I call, but unfortunately the cutoff folds. So now it's heads up, which is worse, because multi-way, the button may check back certain cards on the turn, and I'll be able to realize my equity for free. But heads up, he's going to continue to value bet more cards than he would multi-way. So I need to hit the flush here, but unfortunately it's a king of spades, and I check to him. And he bombs it for $500, and I obviously just have to fold here, um, and he ends up showing the table ace-king. We then pick up Mr. Jigs in the low jack, and I raise to 35. The hijack then 3 bets me to 75, and the button cold 4 bets is $225. And I'm out of position here, to two other opponents, and I wouldn't expect the hijack to ever 3-bet me light. And you just don't see cold 4-bet bluffs like this in live low stakes. So I fold Jack's preflop, and uh, the hijack ended up having pocket 9s, and the button folded on the flop. So I have no clue what he had, but definitely an interesting spot. Congratulations. 
You made it to the part of the video that has kept me up at night for the past week. Um, I want to start this out by saying this was the biggest pot I've ever been in. Uh, I actually called in a Bart Hansen show about this hand, which if you've never heard of him, I'd highly recommend going and checking out some of his videos. Uh, his website is called Crush Life Poker, and he has a huge uh, selection of training videos that I've been studying for about seven months now. Um, this isn't an advertisement, I just genuinely believe he is one of the best teachers you're going to find right now, so I wanted to get his input on this hand. So like I said, I called into his live stream and we broke down this hand, we broke this hand down, so if you want to take a peek at that, uh, I'll leave the link in the description. Uh, let's get started. So our stack is at about 1700, and we're in the big blind with ace, seven of clubs. There's a button straddle, and the small blind comes in throwing fucking haymakers. He raises it to $50. Now this is just an insane raise, and I have seven aggressive players left behind to act. So I do what any rational human would do, and I call the 50. Cut in the gun calls the 50 as well, and under the gun plus one, three bets to $180. Uh, he had just re recently sat down for about 3k, covering everyone, and he's a very aggressive player. It falls back to the small blind who just calls, and now, of course, I'm priced in. I only need to put in 130 to win 720. I make the call, and so does under the gun. Now, before I get a bunch of comments saying that, that, that that's an easy fold preflop. I know. I know. I hear you. I've gone over this hand in my head a thousand times with my buddies multiple times, and then on stream with a professional. I know where I fucked up, and I knew I fucked up when I first called the 50, but that's just a byproduct of being up over $1,000 in a very deep game. Um, and that is one of the big leaks in my game, is not sticking to a solid preflop range when I'm up a lot of money. Uh, I was gambling here, and you know what? Sometimes I just like to fucking gamble, and that shows in my results. But it's also good content for YouTube, so uh, yeah. Let's keep going. Uh, we go four way to a flop of six of diamonds, seven of spades, eight of diamonds, and everyone decides to check here. We go to a turn with everybody still on board, and it comes out the ace of diamonds. Small blind checks to me, and now we have a two pair, and the front door flush did come in, but there's no reason for me to believe anyone has a flush here, so I decided it's time to start value betting. I leave here for 350. And every single goddamn player calls my bet. All three other players call the $350 bet on the turn. Um, I check my hand to make sure it's real, and I see a seven of clubs. Now, something I didn't mention in the live stream is that I actually thought I had ace eight for top two. So when everyone called called my huge bet, I looked down and I realized I had my hand wrong. Even though it is, it literally basically plays the same. I just subconsciously felt like I fucked up. Um, the pod is now $2,120 going four way to a river, which is the five of clubs putting a four liner on the board. Um, small blind checks to me, and I wanted to throw up in my mouth right here, but I decided to just check instead. Under the gun then counts out a healthy bet of $550 and puts it into play. Under the gun, uh, plus one tanks for a bit, and then just calls the bet. Small blind folds, and now it's on me. I need to put in $550 to win $3,770, and based on the action, under the gun plus one would be betting any flush draw, set, or nine on the flop, but when he checks flop and just flats the turn when the ace hits, it's pretty obvious he has like ace king, ace queen. Uh, so to see him make the call in the river kind of blew my mind because I've been thinking ace king or ace queen would call in that spot. Uh, so I'm curious, but I'm pretty sure I have him beat. Um, but the focus is on under the gun, who I just would very rarely assume is bluffing here and to three other opponents and giving them such a good price on the river. Uh, the thing about this though, is that he can have all the flushes and straights here. Think back to how the, how, how the hand played out. You know, on the flop, he's gonna check all those hands to the initial aggressor, any flush draws, any nine X hands. Um, and then if he turned a flush, it would make sense to just flat my bet on the turn with two people behind hoping they'd throw some money in there too. Plus he can have all the 9x suited hands that would call my turn bet. So when he bets river with a sizing that looks so valuey, it seems like such a fold in the moment. I don't know. Um, 
but like Bart said, if you know you have under the gun plus one beat and you're getting a great price to call, um, all you have to do is find the bluff from under the gun here. One out of six times when you're getting six to one on your money. And with the multi-way nature of the board, I should just make the call here. Uh, but I call a clock on myself because subconsciously I don't want to find the call. Um, I'm right back to even at this point and I don't want to be negative for the night after being up so much money. So I call the clock, time runs out, and I let it go. Under the gun shows king of diamonds, queen of hearts, or king fucking high. And under the gun plus one shows ace of spades, queen of hearts, or just top pair. I'm getting chills right now just saying that. Uh, if I would have made that call right there, I would have been at $4,300 and it would have been my biggest cash out of my life. So I definitely had to walk that one off and I ended up finding out that the small blind folded pocket eights on that hand so I didn't even really have the best hand until he folded on the river which makes me feel a little better but doesn't change what could have been. Oh man. That's exactly what I thought was happening too. Was he had a big ace and he was just kind of on because it made sense and it put me yeah. in a weird fucking spot, bro. I think he was oh. gambling either way it goes. So after that unfortunate hand, we're not we're now back down to our buy-in, and I am beyond tilted. My time is about to expire, so I decide I'm going to play one more hand and the clock and then clock out for the night. As I look down at Ace of Diamonds, Queen of Spades, and Under the Gun plus two. There's a button straddle and two calls, so I raise to 30. I get two callers and we go three way to a flop of queen 10 10, two diamonds. Um, I see that $30 and the hijack, who was a dude that called with just an ace on the last hand, raises 150, folds to me and I call. Um, now this is a prime example of tilt. You know, I let my emotions get control of me here and I was thinking on feelings rather than ration rational thought and this dude ended up profiting, profiting off that. Uh, turn is a six of diamonds, and now I have a nut flush draw. And I check to him, and he bets 230. Um, definitely pricing me out here, and it's obvious that he has me beat. But I see the ace of diamonds, and I decided to just call here. Rivers are blank, and he goes, check, check. He shows 910 off for flop trips, and yeah, he pretty much caught max fucking value. Hands like this destroy me because I'm fine with losing my money. You know, I embrace the variance of poker, but this is one of those hands where it's not about the variance. It's tilt compounded with aggressive opponents, and I ended up making a mistake that I had control over. This wasn't a, like a 77% favorite that we got all in with and lost. This is something I that I can physically physically control, but mentally I just didn't. And that's why it's important to be level-headed and to realize when you should and shouldn't be playing. So unfortunately, we are walking out of here with $500 less than what we had when we walked in. Uh, I was up to 2200 at one point, ended up getting in some weird spots, big pots, just, I don't know. I was kind of, I was rushing a lot of my thought processes. Wasn't really happy with how I ended up playing. Um, I kind of just got lost in the moment and all these decisions. Uh, so next time, I'm definitely gonna be trying to be a lot more conscious with my actions and just slow everything down. Um, had a, it was a fucking roller coaster. It sure was. Uh, but I had a, honestly had a really good time. And even though I lost five hundred dollars, it's okay. It's ha it happens. We all know this. Uh, but I got in some like, that A seven spot. Have no clue. I I don't know. I'm gonna have to go over that in my head like fifty times before I go to sleep tonight. Uh, which sucks. I have, I have work in like seven and a half hours. So um, I'm gonna be trying to get that. I'm gonna call into crush live poker hopefully and try to get on their podcast and try to talk about that hand because that was a pretty crazy hand i want to hear some professional analysis on it um but yeah like i said we're down 500 for the day headed home uh hopefully next time is better don't really have anything else much for y'all i'll see y'all next time be easy